thank you for clicking on the video and here today at Mimic, we are going to go over another old first edition D&D module. This is for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. This is called When the Star Falls and it's designated UK4 and it was published by PSR back in 1984. Now the UK series uh, is what it sounds like and you can even see the UK flag there. These are modules published by the UK division of TSR and they came up with a bunch of cool modules. So this goes all the way up to number seven. And we've talked about several of these already. Uh, UK1, which is a fantastic one where you can actually bypass all the combat and solve this uh, with your wits, which is a very cool adventure. Very similarly is UK2 and UK3. And we actually give a free copy of UK3 uh, as a previous giveaway. And we do have a giveaway going on right now for D&D. And that is for one of my red box copies. So I'll put a link down below for this giveaway. And if you're watching this from the future, I'm sure we have another giveaway going on. So I'm gonna go over this entire module and we're gonna film it in 4K so you can read along with me. If you like what you see, hopefully consider liking, sharing, and subbing up so you don't miss out on other cool content we do. And I'll have a playlist of all my other modules that we did. And I think there's over 19 of them already. So this is authored by Mr. Morris, and he has done multiple modules. In fact, he did almost an entire line here. Here you see his name and the credit for number one, number two, number three, number four is right here, and number five as well. So uh, you know you're gonna be in for a treat with his experience with these other modules. We should take time to appreciate the cover here. This is painted by Jeremy Goodwin, who also does the interior art within. And you can see he has a very UK Games Workshop type of appearance. We can see the title of the Star Falls. Yes, there is a shooting star within this game. And you're gonna be hunting for uh, the object. As well as you can see some Duro here, which is a underground humanoid that's gonna dominate some of the caverns that you explore within. All right, so let's get the module out of the protective wrap here. And we can also, I should also mention that this is an adventure module for characters levels three through five. So let's flip it back here and get a sense of what's going on. The power of the prophecy is given to few. Wise are they who guard this gift well, and for those who thirst for such knowledge are not always men of principle. Bastion of destiny, the tower of the heaven stands silhouetted against the star-studded night sky from within his darkened observatory, perched like an iry on the highest turret, a figure in white charts the course of a shooting star as it disappears behind the snow-capped peaks of the mountains. The old man smells grimly to himself, the event foretold has come to pass. So this comet or star is gonna fall and it pertains and the gift of prophecy. So that is the main uh, idea behind this campaign. And you're going to acquire this a shooting star and bring it back to unlock the gifts of prophecy. Okay, so let's take a look at the maps here. And yes, there are two cardboard map shields here. Um, we'll go over each one as we encounter dinner. Here's the Duro, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, here's some other areas to explore. This is another map guide. Pretty beautiful. This is actually in color. And on the flip side here is some more territory we'll explore in the venture. Okay, so we're gonna set this aside and I'll bring this back as need be. And we'll get to the booklet here. Now this booklet, you can see is 32 pages long and it's broken up in various sections here. Once again, authored by Morris with art by Jeremy Goodwin. You can also see here at the top, it recommends it for between six to 10 characters. There's also another tagline here, the shooting star, omen of power, to some, it was the agent of disaster, but to one old man in his tower, it came as no surprise. Okay, so let's flip to the first page. And we can see a introduction here, and it's very detailed. I'm not a fan of these really long introductions uh, to read it to your gaming group. Uh, it's quite lengthy. Uh, I'm not gonna go over the whole thing, but basically, the concept is 
there is a group of sages and they live in this tower of heavens and they have within a book of prophecy and with this book they're able to foretell certain events and that's how they earn their key by uh, trading gold for telling fortunes and everything they say comes to pass within this book of prophecy one of the pages does describe this shooting star that's gonna come and they see it in the sky uh, however, when they refer back to the book to see what happens next, it turns out the pages are now all blank, except for the very last page that says um, you have to bring the shooting star to a group of smiths and they will forge a new book of prophecy. So obviously these sages are very desperate to obtain this shooting star because their livelihood, this tower of heavens, will not function unless they have a working book of prophecy. So this is how you're going to try to help them obtain their new book of prophecy. So this page here has a short outline of what's going to happen in this adventure. You're going to have a combat encounter, followed by an encounter with a druid. Then you're going to run into a Doro Lair where the star has fallen into. You're going to transport that star over a pass, bring it to the Tower of Heavens, and forge this new book of prophecy. Uh, there is some terms here, uh, not too important. And there's some examples of plot hooks here to link this to your current campaign. We'll flip to the next page. And this is titled Death on the Moors. Now, this is very interesting to me because the other first three modules in this series, these modules are very famous, as I mentioned, to be able to avoid combat. In fact, this very first one, you could complete the entire campaign without lifting your sword. And this one, you actually have to do combat. If you don't fight this creature, you will not actually be able to complete any of the adventure. So I thought that was very interesting that it starts off this way. The setup is you're going to encounter a couple of monks that are lying down. They look comatose or dead. And they're covered with this web. And this web is not a spider web but it's actually a memory web. This creature does exactly what it sounds like. It feeds on the psychic energy of memories to feed and grow, and you need to defeat this creature. In fact, when you approach it, the web will just come right at the player characters, and they have to actually kill this creature. If they don't, they will not be imbued with the memories that spill out from this creature. Um, before I go over these memories, let's just flip it to the back of the module, which details this new creature, the memory web here. The idea of a memory web nowadays is probably more commonplace. However, this is the first actual occurrence of this monster in D&D. So let's go back to the adventure itself. And when you slay this creature, as I mentioned, multiple memories will spell out. Now, some of the memories of the monks have to do with day-to-day -day rituals, but the ones highlighted here, these are in relationship to what their mission is, where they have been sent out by the Tower of Heavens to get in contact with a druid who might lead him to where this star fell. So you can see here there are actually 19 memories, and not all of them are relevant. Uh, certainly when I played this as a game, I don't remember going through all 19 of these uh, thoughts and memories. I think our DM was very generous. He gave us some of the more relevant ones rather than for us to hunt and seek and chase red herrings and just get us into the adventure. Uh, so that's of course an option for you guys to do, but there is 19 of them and certainly I wouldn't want to waste time filling around with memories that are not relevant like the last good meal. So here's a picture here. Uh, this event, by the way, takes place on map one here, the region, the memory web is found here. You can, you don't really have to use this map. You could place this encounter in any map, of course. So let's move on. We have a list of random encounters here. The most interesting of note is giant sheep here. So the next part of the module is called Paisar Shadow. And he is basically one of the apprentices for the Elder Mage of the Tower of Heavens. He is known as Shafley, and Shafley was the one that sent these monks to contact the Druid. However, 
Pizar, he wants to obtain this stone himself and obtain the book of prophecy for himself. So he has sent out one of his minions, Sion, and he is in control of a raven as well as a shadow mastiff. And so this lends to the second combat you have to do. You can't avoid this. So once again, different from the other three initial modules, you have to do this encounter as well. So the setup is Sion hasn't found the group of monks yet. The ventures have found them first. However, his raven saw what happened with the memory web and how the ventures killed the memory web. And so Sion knows that the ventures probably have some information that he needs. And so he hunts them down and uses his shadow mastiff to do that. In fact, the raven, as well as Sion himself, will attack at night at the first opportunity they can. So even if your player characters defeat Sion here, there's nothing on this page that gives the player characters information that there is this political intrigue or coup going on. I think that's one of the first problems of this module. AM can easily rectify this by throwing in a quote that Sion says when he's fighting, such as, oh, this is maybe not worth uh, uh, the money given by Pizar or, or something of that nature. But once again, there's nothing in here or on his body like a letter uh, saying that he's been sent on this task. So that is one problem that needs to be rectified. Let's move on. So after player characters and character Sion, they, your player characters will go into a valley, Coon, that is the home of the druid Durwith. And in this valley, they will encounter two giant eagles that will sort of lead the player characters to where his home is. And if the player characters fight these eagles, well, the druid's not going to be happy. The characters might have to do battle with everyone there. Um, so this, uh, this valley is almost like a nature preserve. It has multiple creatures living here. You've got a saber-toothed tiger, giant goats, and a gorilla. In fact, on the map here, Plan C, you can see there are multiple other creatures that live on this zoo-like habitat. The eagles and the druids stay here, but there is, once again, a saber-toothed tiger, giant goats, a gorilla, giant stags, giant wasps, giant otters, and huge spiders. All right. So here is more details of the map I just showed you and uh, the description and stats of the creatures. Next up is the Doro Lair. So the druid, of course, will be able to relay information about where the shooting star landed as he is in tune with nature in the surrounding area. And once again, it has landed in a Doro Lair. And when the player characters go into this region, they will see a lot of catastrophic damage from this large shooting star crashing into their habitat and destroying many of their underground caves. And many Doro have died, and there's some human slaves trying to uh, dig out the survivors. Um, there's also mention that the Duros believe this large shooting star is an object of great importance and they have moved it to another location and they want to build a shrine around it. All right, so in here we have more descriptions of the actual lair itself. So you can see here on the map the Duro lair, the shooting star has crashed in this general direction and has caused some catastrophic damage to this section of their lair. So there's a lot of ruins and rubbles and cave-ins right here. There is a temple that they had originally here in section 5 and this shooting star has destroyed their idol there and now they believe this shooting star is even of greater importance and they have actually transported to this section room 7 here. Now, because of multiple cave-ins, the player characters will not be able to escape this way. They will have to progress further into this uh, lair. And there is a monster or creature encounter here at room 11. So, once again, the temple that they had originally here is room 5. But the shooting star is not in here. It's actually in room 7 where the slave pens are. And as I mentioned earlier, there are multiple human slaves in this area. However, they've been quite abused and they will not be able to help with any combat or give any details about where to go or where anything is as they are of very low intelligence. So the student star is locked in his chest here 
and it's guarded by several students that are trying to study this. So the shooting star is roughly spherical and only weighs about 10 pounds and it's the size of a grapefruit. But because of its great denseness and its high velocity on impact, it caused catastrophic damage. Let's get on to the next page here. And as I mentioned, towards room 11, there is an encounter with a creature, and it is a Lamia. Now, this Lamia is trapped by the falling debris, and she will hear the ventures coming to her area as they have to progress in her direction. Her first reaction is to cast an illusion and to make believe that there is another cave in. This creature is actually an ally to the Duro and will fight on their behalf. So this is another encounter you can't really actually bypass. Now that your player characters have attained the shooting star and survived the lair, they're going to have to make their way through a pass to head towards the Tower of Heavens. Along the way, there will be a beaver dam and a group of hunters. However, these are all optional. Uh, they are all relatively neutral and your player characters can easily just bypass this encounter without any trouble. To get your bearings straight, here's a reference map of the pass, the beaver dam, the beaver home itself, and where the hunters are. So pretty simple map, but I'm glad they still included it. So we're halfway through the module, and this next half predominantly takes place in the Tower of Heavens. The player characters will remember from their uh, imbued memories from the memory web that they have to bring this shooting star to the Tower of Heavens, give it to the Elder Sage there, and then they will bring it to the uh, Forge to unlock new books of prophecy. Now, unbeknownst to the player characters, once again, there is a coup going on. Now, there are multiple other sages in the tower, and each one is protected by a routine of monks. And all these monks protect their assigned sage. Now, the leader of the sages, uh, Shafi, he is the one that sent out those monks that you saw that got trapped by the memory web. So he's actually left defenseless. And Paisar thought this was a perfect opportunity to stage his coup. Basically, he has uh, announced that the sage is dead. He doesn't say necessarily what he died of or whatnot, but everyone believes him because they have no reason to doubt him. And the elder sage, Safi, he's actually still alive and he's sequestered and trapped in his own apartment towers. Now, over here, uh, you see some uh, details describing this story and some uh, main uh, players. And on the next page here, you're going to be introduced to the fairy man. So this Tower of Heavens, it's surrounded by water, and the fairy man's going to be over here. And you will have to encounter the fairy to basically reach the rest of this uh, region. Now, this fairy man actually knows that the Elder Sage is still alive because the Elder Sage was able to mind contact the fairy man, who is a devout follower, and knows what is going on, that Paisar is leading this coup, and that he needs to have someone rescue him. So when the player characters enter this region, basically they're told this entire story by the ferryman, so they're up to date. Now, it's easy for the player characters to get into the tower because the ferryman says, well, all you have to do is pose that you want to get a prophecy read, and of course the sages will admit you, and uh, if you pay them uh, 3,000 gold, they will tell your prophecy. And so, you know, your player characters can play along, and basically a lot of these room descriptions is uh, getting to the tower, going to the visitor area, and encountering um, one of the sages that will expound a prophecy, but it's meaningless because once again, the Book of Prophecies are all blank now. And that's the whole goal of the story is to obtain the shooting star to unlock new books of prophecy. Um, the rest of this uh, details some of the uh, garrison. Uh, these sages are protected also by a um, regiment of gnomes, which is sort of interesting. And they're very uh, loyal to the sages. Now, they follow Paisar right now because they believe he's the Elder Sage. But if you are able to rescue the Elder Sage from his apartments, they will uh, follow Shafi himself. Uh, so that's one way you could uh, uh, 
combat the Paisar is uh, recruit the gnomes. However, once again, the gnomes and the other sages do not know that their elder sage is still alive and they follow the instructions of Paisar, who will do anything possible to retain his rule. So the sages and the monks and the gnomes will all attack you if you become aggressive. And at some point, you're going to have to do so because your goal is once again to rescue the elder sage who is held in his apartment. So a lot of this description is about some of the runes as well as the gnomes and the other sages. And as I mentioned, each sage is protected by their own routine of monks. So it's a pretty tough battle. Um, now, some of the other UK modules mention little shortcuts or tricks that you can do to sort of bypass a lot of combat. Uh, there is nothing of that nature in this module. So it's going to be up to the player wits to maybe uh, have a, a visibility spell or whatnot or charm a person to sort of get information and hopefully bypass a lot of this combat because once again, there's a lot of foes to fight. Fighting Paisar himself is quite a difficult battle. He has, of course, a regiment of spells he can use. He's protected by his bodyguard of monks, and he also has an imp familiar in raven form that will lend its power of regeneration. So that's a tough battle. Now, moving on, there is a, a description of a lot of the rooms and one of the more interesting ones is this great library. And this is where Shafei is actually found. So this library is in room 19, which is here. But you can see there are stairways going down. And that's going to be in relationship to this, where this is the Bridge of Faith. Now, this library has a gigantic prismatic sphere. And within this sphere is where the Books of Prophecy are and they're basically burning. He's destroying them as a way to prevent Pizard from getting hold of the books, but it's not too relevant. As I mentioned, the books are all blank now, except for the last page that mentions that you gotta bring this shooting star to the forge to unlock new books of prophecy. But he's just doing this to prevent the abuse of the remaining books. Maybe the previous prophecies might hold some value for others. Eventually, the player characters, of course, encounter Shafi, and he will relay some of the information that uh, he's under duress uh, by this coup going on. And he will state that you got to bring this shooting star to a forge, and that it has been determined once again by the last page of the prophecy. He will entice the player characters with some treasures, and I believe that's on the next page here. And you can roll to uh, determine randomly what treasure he might want to grant on a player to accomplish this goal. The Elder Limage will accompany the player characters. And as he is the only one that can read the Book of Prophecies, uh, he may be helpful to bring along. Now, the player characters can sort of go back down the tower and fight all these other people, maybe uh, convince the gnomes to fight on their behalf now that they have the elder mage in hand. However, another way thing can go is further higher up the tower. And there is this labyrinth here, which is a strange magical labyrinth, and it's full of phantasmal killers. It's uh, quite dangerous, but uh, Shafe is able to navigate through it and hopefully lead the player cares uh, unscathed. And then we could end up in the observatory, which is at the very top of the tower, and maybe uh, find some way to get down or uh, bypass all these other sages, monks, and gnomes. Uh, so that's a, another option of to escape the tower. Now, once the player characters escape the tower, they're gonna make their way to the forge, and hopefully Shafei is in hand with them. Now, this forge is manned by Sheriff Lampley. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, but they're a group of deep gnomes. And as most gnomes are, they're very into gadgets. Now, they actually have in this habitat another prismatic sphere that ended up 
uh, being a companion to the one that is in the Great Library. And next to the sphere was a prophecy, a piece of paper that denotes that eventually a black stone will be brought to this um, sphere and doing so will unlock some books of prophecy and the black stone itself uh, can be forged and found to have the greatest gem of all gems right here. So they know that this black stone will come eventually and the greed of this small group of gnomes overwhelms them and basically they turn evil is the uh, story here. Uh, I do find it a little bit strange uh, and I will uh, tell you the reason why a little bit later. Now, because this group of deep gnomes know about the prophecy and how important it is to obtain the black stone and that it will eventually turn into the greatest gems, uh, they will actually not fight the player characters and if they introduce themselves and say what they need to do, they will actually help them and show them where the sphere is and allow them to have this uh, shooting star touch a sphere, basically unlock the sphere, and the player characters are allowed to remove the new books of prophecy within and give it to the elder uh, sage. They won't actually stop them to do any of that. All they ask in return is to have the uh, shooting star, the black stone, which is foretold in the prophecy. And once they obtain the stone, the weird thing about this story is that they will trigger a collapse and self-destruction of this entire region. There is no real explanation for this, aside from, as I mentioned, that they have turned evil. Maybe they are chaotic evil, but if they were that chaotic evil, why not just kill the player characters and just take the stone? Uh, I find it a little bit odd. And even if they didn't do that, they're given the stone anyways, and they don't need to kill anyone. They could, they have the stone. So I find that a little bit odd. Perhaps uh, maybe your DM can add a side story that the uh, deep gnomes uh, regret having to stay here and be in this region for so long. Maybe they want to move to a different habitat. Um, there is some danger around this area. This habitat is actually has a pair of red dragons, so maybe they don't want to be around this region, but you might add to the story to make it more sense of what's going to happen. So these following pages describe the area of the deep gnome lair and what is going on within. I guess I should also mention that there are these large tank-like objects right here that uh, <laughs> are interesting and they're like steampunk tanks and these will also be triggered to self-destruct the region once the gnomes have obtained the black stone. So after exchange, as I mentioned, they will basically press on a concealed panel, which was uh, cause a heavy iron door to slide across the position and basically trigger an earthquake or self-destruct uh, mechanism within this entire region. Uh, this will cause a great deal of noise and this will cause two red dragons uh, to investigate who live uh, around this region. Referencing the map, this is the forge and here is the inner hall where that prismatic sphere is and the dragon's lair is room 12 however there's no room 12 on this map it's a little bit odd i have to assume it's somewhere down over here now this pair of red dragons will fly out as i mentioned and investigate this self-destruct or commotion around the area it doesn't say specifically that the dragons will attack the player characters. There's a mention here that the gnomes have bribed the dragons with a lot of treasure. So it's possible that the player characters could bribe this pair of dragons too to uh, uh, forgive them for causing a lot of commotion and they would accept the treasure just fly away. But there is probably a workaround against this encounter. And on the next page, it just shows the new monsters that steampunk tank that I mentioned, as well as the memory web. 
it doesn't actually have an epilogue as far as the player characters obtaining the new books of prophecy. The older sage takes these new books of prophecies and brings it back to the Tower of Heavens and uh, starts their telling uh, activities all over again. So that basically is When a Star Falls UK4. What did you think about this module? In my opinion, it's, it's sort of average. It's definitely not my favorite of the UK series. So it'll probably be uh, module number one. And I don't think it is up to the caliber of uh, number two and number three. Now in the future, I'll discuss UK five, six, and seven as well. Uh, leave me a comment down below if you ever uh, played in this campaign or ran it yourself. I'm interested to know how you solve some of the problems about this module with the storytelling aspect. So at its heart, this is basically a fetch and retrieve type quest. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that type of quest. I think it could probably be better done. What I really love about this module is how it starts with that encounter with the memory web. I think that's something you could probably use uh, with other campaigns or stories as a plot gimmick. Uh, I really like that aspect. Uh, but once again, as far as the rest of this adventure is concerned, I thought it was uh, about average. So thank you for listening to my ramblings and review about this module. I hope you found this interesting. And if you did, hopefully you sub up so you could not miss out on the other modules we'll go over. Thanks for watching, everybody. Keep on adventuring out there.